What up? Welcome back to Wednesday night. I hope you guys are having a fantastic week. I'm excited to be back with you, looking at some scripture tonight, getting ready for when we can meet back together again. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 24 and Exodus chapter 32. So if you want to take a few minutes and read those two chapters and then come back and join us, you will understand a lot more of what we're going to talk about here in a few minutes and why it matters to us. So thanks for jumping in and joining us tonight. We hope you have a good time. Hey, I hope you took a few minutes to read those chapters that we talked about. If reading is not really your deal, then let me challenge you to listen to them. You can find audio versions of, of every passage of scripture just by Googling it, or I'm sure on Spotify, or even with different uh, platforms like, like Blue Letter Bible or gatewaybible.com. Different places like that will actually read it to you if reading's not your deal. The most important thing is that you dive into scripture and you get involved in God's word, because that's when God can speak to your heart. He can use a lot of other things too, but we have God's written word for our benefit and for our growth, and I think it's very, very important. Um, I, I got a question for you as we, as we get started tonight, but how do you deal with impatience or how do you deal with the time when God seems like he's silent? You know, right now we have a ton of time. We have a ton of, of, of freedom to kind of live our life however we want to live it right now. And it can be very easy in those moments to really look at God and say, wow, God is silent. God is not doing anything. And, and I'm just going to I'm just gonna do what I want. Maybe that decision's a little more subconscious than it is we, we woke up one morning and decided to go do our own thing. Maybe it's more just a result of what kinda happens through our day as we're bored or we have nothing to do. Um, I think that often we have the best intentions, right? Maybe you walked into this time off with some resolutions or things that you wanted to accomplish or do in your free time, but we got the attention span of a goldfish and we just, we just don't do very well in those situations, do we? Well, the same things happened here in, in 24 and 32 of Exodus. And if you read them, you'll know what I'm talking about. The people that are there have just received all of the law, all the commandments and things that they're supposed to live by now, this, this new relationship that they have with God. And it's going to be a, an incredibly cool thing. And God is on this mountain and there's, there's fire and there's smoke and there's thunderstorms and lightning. And, and Moses and the elders go up to this mountain and, and God asks them, hey, are you going to, are you going to follow my rules? Are you going to live in this covenant, this promise, this relationship with me? And twice in Exodus chapter 24, the people say, yeah, yeah, we can do that. No problem. No sweat. They make this re resolution. There's this big confirmation ceremony, if you will, where the, the elders of Israel and Moses and Aaron and Joshua have this, this feast in God's presence. And there's this whole issue of blood where animals are killed and they, they throw the blood on the people as a, as a mark of this new relationship that they have. It's kind of like a, like when you were kids, if you ever like did like a pinky promise like that, I can't do it because I don't know, I'm just not good at those things. Or like if you ever got really crazy and like, like poked your finger with a pin and like rubbed it on your friend, which is really gross now, don't ever do that. But sometimes we do weird stuff like that to like guarantee stuff from a little kid. It looked a little bit of the same way in that relationship with God. They did these things in order to say, yes, we're going to do, we're going to obey, we're going to be the people that you want us to be. And God in turn said, I will bless you, I will protect you, I will take care of you. All of that's in chapter 24. Um, but then at the end of that chapter, something crazy happens. God wants to give Moses further instruction. And he says in verse number 12, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. Now, I'm sure you've seen pictures of the Ten Commandments written on these little like tombstone looking rocks that Moses is always carrying around in the, in the old pictures. But God wrote these things in stone kind of as a, as a memorial to say, hey, this is lasting. This is permanent. And you've agreed to this and it's now written in stone. Kind of a, kind of a big deal. Um, in verse 13, so Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up into the mountain of God and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Now, if you remember, Aaron is Moses' brother. And he had kind of been Moses' mouthpiece when they were in Egypt and, and trying to get out of, of, of slavery, that Aaron was typically the one that spoke on Moses' behalf. And so um, verse 15 tells us that Moses goes up on the mountain. The, the Lord covers the mountain in, in further clouds. And it's covered for six days. Moses has to wait. And on the seventh day, um, he, it says in verse number 16, it says, on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. 
and it says the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. In other words, people can see what's happening here. It's impressive. It's, it's terrifying. Um, in verse 18, Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So if you think from the time God says, hey, I want you to come up here to the time Moses comes back down, we got 46 days. Now, uh, doing the math, it's, Sunday, uh, it's Wednesday. Um, I don't know how long you've been home. I've been home, will have been, uh, well, sorry, I'm really bad at math. I will have been home 22 days today. 22 days I've been home. So not even half yet what Moses had been gone. I know some of you have been home longer because your school got out before a bit, uh, like the week before all this stuff happened. But um, either way, if you can imagine that, for 46 days, he's just gone. Now, we know how bored we've gotten in the 22 days or you in the almost 30 days or 30 plus days that you've been home. Can you imagine what the people of Israel are doing in that time? Well. Exodus 32 tells us, so while Moses is on the mountain, um, if you read Exodus 25, 26, 27, all the way through 31, um, it's all these extra instructions God is giving Moses for how they're supposed to worship, what the temple is supposed to look like, what their feasts are supposed to look like, how the Sabbath days are supposed to happen, and all these things. And a lot of important things happen in those chapters. You should read them, but for the sake of our discussion, we're going to skip to 32, because in 32, things go sideways for everybody. The people get tired, they, they get bored. Um, and, and it, what's crazy to me when you think about this, these people thought that they could meet God's standard, right? They thought they could obey all of the things that God had commanded them to do, but they couldn't handle the same amount of time that you've been home right now. They couldn't do it. And, and I wonder if that wouldn't be the same as true for us. You know, a lot of times we think, hey, I want to have this particular relationship with God, or I want to feel this way about my scripture reading or my prayer life. And maybe if you're like me, you like rules and you like setting up processes and things and I'm going to start a new routine or I'm going to start a new habit or something like that. That's how I'm wired. Maybe you're not wired that way at all. But a lot of times we get in our mind that we can actually do and be the kind of person that God wants us to be if we really, really wanted to. That we could be good enough if we really just tried hard, if we disciplined ourselves and, um, and, and worked really, really hard for it. Um, but these people could not do that. And the question is, can you? Can you meet God's standard? You think about most of the Ten Commandments, that you love the Lord your God, don't have any other gods, um, don't murder, don't, you know, don't steal. There's lots of things that, that go into that. Um, and we might look at that list and say, well, yeah, I cannot do those things. Um, but can we? When, when you look at the people that are involved in these two chapters, you have, you have three roughly, you have one group of people and two people that are really important here, or three people that are really important. You've got Moses, twice, in Exodus chapter 32, when God becomes angry with the people of Israel, Moses offers himself in their place. Matter of fact, even when God says, you know what, I'm sick and tired of these, these stiff-hearted, these, these arrogant, dumb people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart with you. Moses says, no, please don't do that. You're going to look bad. And, and, God, and Moses really talks God down twice, which is really crazy to me. Um, you've got Aaron, um, who when these people get bored, they, they come to him and say, hey, Moses has been gone a while. We don't even know if he's still alive. Um, why don't you make us a God? And Aaron is so concerned with his own image. He's so concerned with everything that's going on and making sure he maintains his authority or whatever that he says, okay, bring me all your gold earrings and bring me all your gold jewelry. And he gets it all together and he gets a person and they, they make a golden cow, which thinks really, it sounds really dumb, but if you look at ancient things that people worship, um, the cow was a really big deal in that particular part of the world at that particular time. And so they, they make this, this golden cow, or calf, the Bible calls it, like a baby cow. And not only that, they build, Aaron himself builds an altar to this calf, and they begin to worship it. Matter of fact, Aaron says in chapter 32, verse number... Um, Where is it? Uh, yeah, he says uh, in verse number four, he says, he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. It's terrifying. They're at the bottom of a mountain where God is at the top, where they can see the fire and the smoke and the clouds and all the things that are there. And Aaron literally just made something out of jewelry that people brought to him and says, this is your God. 
that brought you up out of Egypt. Like that, that's crazy. Like that, that's insane that he would go from that quickly to, uh, to, to worshiping the God, being on the mountain with God, being in the presence of God, to worshiping a, a piece of metal. Um, it, it's nuts. And I think that, that Aaron really here was, was too afraid of what people thought. And he cared too much about other people's opinion. And when Moses challenges him about us, about it in verse 21, he tries to shift the blame and says, yeah, we just took it all and threw it in the fire and this came out. So yeah, it must be God. Cool. Um, Moses is a buy it. Nobody else does. Um, you can't shift the blame there. He walked away from God. He couldn't meet God's standard. He decided to try to do things on his own and it failed. And then you've got the people that are here, all these people. And they were simply bent on doing things their own way. They simply just wanted to live their life the way that they thought best. Um, and, and again, it, it, it seems crazy to us, right? In 21st century, we think about um, how close these people were to God. We think about the visible presence of God in front of them. And even with the visible presence of God in front of them, they still went their own way and did their own thing. Now, I, I talk to a lot of people who struggle with the idea of God. They, they struggle with the fact that they can't see God, feel God, touch God, whatever. And they, they, a lot of people I've talked to in the past, they'll say things like, if I could just see God, then I would have no problem believing. If I could just touch God, I would have no problem believing. Well, these people did, and it didn't matter for them. It didn't change anything for them. The, the issue was their heart. The issue was, going, was what was going on inside of them, not what they could see with their eyes. It says that God's presence was so powerful in, in chapter 20 of Exodus that people were terrified to even get close to the mountain. So it wasn't a matter of being able to see God, it was everything to do with who they wanted to worship. And at the end of the day, they wanted a God that they can control, a God that they can make, a God that wasn't gonna organize their life. See, within the space of 40 days, 46 days if you wanna get technical here, People went from saying, yes, I'll obey God, I'll do everything that God wants me to do, to I'm gonna do my own thing and I don't really give a crap about what God says. That's what happens here. Now, I really believe that following God means learning to wait in a lot of situations. And we see that happening here for Moses, we see that happening for the, the nation of Israel. But in that waiting is when we recognize our actual need for a savior. See, Jesus is more than just a get out of, of hell free card. A lot of times we treat him that way, that as long as we're saved, we're good, eventually one day we're gonna live forever and we can do kind of whatever we feel like we wanna do now. But it's in that waiting for God to do things that we understand absolutely how much we need Jesus. Because I, I really believe that even at our best, we cannot be good enough to meet what God expects from us. When you read the Bible, whether you read the Old Testament or the New Testament, you look at the list of things that, that God expects his followers to be loving and generous and patient and kind and joyful and all the things that go along with the, the, the Holy Spirit's working in your life and, and the things that God has called us to do as far as sharing the gospel with our community and the world. And we say, uh, yeah, I can do that. I can, I can discipline myself to make that happen. But in the waiting for God to act, we actually realize the fact that we can't. And then I've been pondering this a little bit myself this last week. If you could, would you? Right? Like I said before, we have best intentions. We want to do well. I think that everybody wants to do well. Um, for example, I like to run, and I'm, it's about the one sport I'm, I'm halfway any decently good at, is I can run okay for uh, my age and, and where I am, but I, that's okay. Another side story. I have this dream that I will wake up every morning at four o'clock in the morning, go run for 12 miles, and and, and just be this, this incredible marathon runner. Uh, you know, beating Usain Bolt and all the crazy people that, that run the marathons, which um, realistically, I have the capability of doing. Maybe not beating Usain Bolt, but I have the capability of getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I have the capability, if I really push myself, to go run 10 miles every day, but I don't. Matter of fact, I'm lucky to get out of bed before 6.30. Some days I'm lucky to get out of bed before 7.30 um, and, and get up and go. The potential for me is there. There's nothing holding me back. My family responsibilities don't keep me from getting up that early and going running. Uh, my, my body doesn't keep me from getting up and, and, and going that early to go running. Uh, there is no reason for me not to do it except that I just don't want to. And I think it works a lot the same way in our walk with God, in our relationship with God, and how are we supposed to live life that even if we could do things best, I don't think we would. Um, I think that at our best, or even at our best, 
we absolutely need God's help in order to meet God's expectations. And when we meet God's expectations, that's where we find purpose, that's where we find hope, that's where we find um, fulfillment, whether you're stuck at home, locked in your room, or you're out and about doing your, your normal things, that we um, have to have that, that sense of happiness, that sense of fulfillment. And I think that only comes when we fulfill God's expectations for our life, but I think that we can only do that when we allow God to help us and we throw ourselves on the grace and mercy of our Savior who helps us meet God's expectations because on our own we can't. I, I, I wanna wrap everything up today with this, so that even in our best intentions, we can't be what we want to be or what God wants us to be. We have to have a Savior hit us there. And that's where these people were gonna arrive up to, that even with God in front of them, even with this, this new resolution to do right, those people still could not do what they needed to do. They could not meet God's expectations. They needed someone to save them. For the time being, in their lifetime, Moses went on their behalf and begged God not to destroy them. And in the same capacity, Jesus Christ does the same thing for you and me that he approaches and he it works as an intermediary on our behalf to the Father and says, you know what, their sins are covered. I've got them, please don't destroy them. That's the message of the gospel. That's what we want other people to believe and to trust in. And that's what the hope that we have to communicate that even at our best, we can never be what God wants us to be. But Jesus offers us a way to do that. So how are you going to hope in that this week? How is that going to change your mindset and your attitudes this week? How are you going to do life differently based on the fact that you can't meet your expectations or God's? When are you going to surrender those things and give those things to him and let him do with what your life what he wants to do with it? That's the most important thing. And that's where you find happiness. That's where you find fulfillment, even when you're stuck at home with absolutely nothing to do. I want to say thank you for watching this evening. I hope I've given you some things to think about, and I hope that you will dig a little deeper in this. The next couple weeks, we're going to move through um, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, and a few of the other, uh, like, like Numbers, some of the books. We'll move through those a little more quickly than we move through Exodus, but there's some important things there that I think that God wants us to know. Just to remind you, we've got the Seed Podcast with Nathan Dudley and Cameron Swed. Comes out every week. These guys are doing a great job. They're kind of working in tandem uh, with me and some others on our Wednesday night stuff. So I encourage you to listen to them. They have their own Spotify. They're on their own. They have their own website on Wix now. Uh, they've got their own Twitter and I think Instagram as well. But we're also co-hosting their stuff on our Facebook and on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll do my best to do our Instagram things. For whatever reason, Instagram doesn't like me when I try to upload videos. So you can check the there, but look for look at YouTube if you want to see any of our videos. That's our, our best place to go. Um, secondly, I'm going to ask you to, to like what we do, to comment, to share it, and then to subscribe to our channels. Um, the more people you invite and get involved with us, the more people we can expose the gospel to, and I think that's a great thing. Lastly, um, if you have suggestions for how to make this better, I would love to speak with you. You can text me, you can call me, you can comment on this video. If you would like to be on one of these videos, we can do that. I'm looking forward to next week. We've got a uh, student lined up, I hope, to uh, work with us on some stuff, and it's going to be a cool thing. But either way, have a good night, and we hope to see you again in just a couple of days. Thank you.